Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity Podcast. Singularity Podcast is a feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Socrates and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, I'm privileged to have Dr. Aubrey de Grey as my guest with the answers. Dr. de Grey is a controversial author, gerontologist and chief science officer at the Sense Foundation and is most famous for his quest to defeat aging. Hi, Aubrey, and welcome to Singularity Podcast. It is great to have you here today. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for being here, Aubrey. I know that your time is most valuable, and thus I will jump straight into the questions by asking you this. Can you please tell us a a little bit about yourself, such as your background and your education, but especially why and how you got interested in becoming a gerontologist in general and decided to begin your campaign to defeat aging in particular? Well, I actually did not start as a biologist at all. Originally, my training as an undergraduate was in computer science. And I got into that field because I was interested in helping to develop artificial intelligence. In other words, to develop computers that would relieve humanity of the tedious business of having to do manual labor like going down mines or other uh, pointless jobs like serving hamburgers. Uh, I felt that it was important to try to develop these machines and give humanity the opportunity to spend our time doing things we're good at, like enriching each other's lives. And I still think that that is an extremely important quest. However, about 20 years ago, I met, and shortly after that, I married a biologist, a geneticist, who was a professor at the University of California in San Diego. And over the next few years, first of all, I learned a lot of biology, just sort of by accident over the dinner table. And secondly, I gradually began to understand that very few biologists were actually interested in aging which surprised me enormously and horrified me because it has always been obvious to me that aging is very bad for you and also that in principle it can be treated by medical intervention. So I eventually decided that this was an even more important problem for me to work on than artificial intelligence. And so around 1994-95 I switched fields. So was that a very hard transition to move from computer science into biology? Actually, no, I was very lucky in that way. First of all, from the point of view of the actual subject matter, um, I think it's important to understand that research is a very transferable skill. It's something that if you're good at it in one discipline, you can pretty quickly get good at it in another discipline just by learning, um, just, by, you know, just by reading the literature and generally getting to know what's already known. Um, secondly, my circumstances at that time were very conducive to being able to change fields because at that time I had taken an extremely undemanding uh, database job, basically a bioinformatics job at the University of Cambridge, which gave me plenty of access to all the university facilities and so on, but which did not really take too much of my time or at least not my energy. So I had plenty of spare quality time to spend doing research. And actually, I was doing artificial intelligence research in my spare time during that time, up until about 94, um, which was easy simply to reallocate to this new subject. And what was the main motivation behind your change of fields and your consequent work? Um, Is it scientific curiosity? Is it uh, humanitarian? Is it the religious one? I see. Yeah, it's definitely humanitarian. I have always been driven by that sort of thinking. I have always been focused on making a difference to the world. I think that if I personally were to benefit from the therapies that I'm hoping to help develop, then, uh, you know, that's great, but that's not why I'm doing it. I don't feel that there is really any particular religious motivation either way. I mean, I certainly think that this work is in accord with the teachings of the major religions, but it's certainly not the reason why I'm doing this. Um, And also, I'm not really driven by 
the, the quest for knowledge either. I think for me, it, I've always regarded myself more as a technologist than as a basic scientist. I'm interested in developing knowledge for the sake of improving people's quality of life rather than just for its own sake. So it seems that in that case, for you, probably the most important thing would be the results, the actual outcome of your work. Is that correct? Absolutely. So what would be the ultimate goal or the ultimate end in that case for you? The ultimate goal really is to keep people healthy as long as they live. At the moment, it's pretty clear that a lot of bad things go wrong with us when we get old. And these are health problems that people really don't enjoy. I never meet anyone who actually wants to get Alzheimer's disease, for example. So I simply want to work to help people to avoid the diseases of old age, however long they live. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this because they realize that a lot of what I do involves thinking about the possibility of people living a lot longer. But that's not why I work on this. I don't work on longevity. People will live a lot longer if the therapies that I'm describing are successfully developed, but that will be a side benefit. The main purpose of all this is simply to keep people healthy. That's great, but aren't you at least a little bit concerned that a natural or man-made disaster such as nuclear war or uh, global warming or some other uh, huge natural catastrophe would kind of negate or destroy the, the sort of results of your work, even if you're successful in it? I don't really think that natural disasters or anything like that would remotely negate this work. No, I think that we are definitely, as a, as a population, as a, as, a, as a species, we are definitely blessed with a survival instinct, with the desire to remain healthy and alive as long as we can. And, you know, if things do happen that are out of our control, then so be it. However, I do think, uh, in a point perhaps related to your question, that there is a good chance that we would be able to allocate more effort, so to speak, to the actual um, attempt to avoid death from other causes, whether it be natural disasters or um, pandemics or, um, you know, uh, even road accidents. And, and I think that would be a good thing, too. I think if we uh, um, assign greater value to life as a result of this work. I see. And uh, what would be the, the benchmarks that uh, would show that you would that you have either succeeded or failed in accomplishing your goals? Well, I don't really think it's a matter of succeeding or failing. I think it's really simply a matter of how rapidly we succeed. I'm approaching this problem in a particular way, namely the application of regenerative medicine to the problem of aging. And other people are approaching it in different ways, including, for example, the development of nanotechnology, or for that matter, the development of artificial intelligence, which may create computers that are smarter than us and therefore that can solve that problem more quickly than we can. Um, so I think that it's great that all of these approaches are being tried. And I think that the measure of success will simply be how rapidly we succeed, not whether we succeed. However, if we look at the milestones that are going to happen on the way to success, I think we can point to some, some things. Certainly with respect to the approach that I'm taking, the application of regenerative medicine to the problem of aging. I think that the most important milestone will be the development of these therapies that can be applied to mice, because mice are the most important model organism in biology. They are fairly similar to humans because they are mammals, but they, of course, live a lot less long than humans. And yet they get more. They get many of the same problems as we do and uh, during old age. So I think that if we can take normal mice and do absolutely nothing at all to them until they are perhaps two thirds of the way through their normal lifespan, and then if we can do a whole lot of things to them, regenerative things, rejuvenation technologies to them at that point, 
with the result that they remain healthy for maybe an extra couple of years longer than normal, then we will have definitely demonstrated that the regenerative medicine approach to combating aging can work. We will know at that point that it's really definitely only a matter of time before it works for human beings as well. At that point, I feel that my work will really have been done because there will be a full-blown war on aging. Everyone will know not only that this is an important goal, but broadly how to go about it. And the money will certainly be no object. And there will be plenty of people who are much better than me at all the things I'm supposed to be good at who will be participating in that effort at that point. So how does the Sense Foundation fit into your work and your um, general goals? Well, at the moment, the main thing that we're doing is to fill in the gaps, so to speak, to actually, um, I don't know, uh, identify the things that are being most neglected, but which we feel are nevertheless indispensable components of a panel of interventions that would really successfully combat aging. And there are lots of those gaps right now. There are some aspects of um, of regenerative medicine that are well understood in terms of their value and increasingly well understood in terms of their value in combating aging, combating aspects of aging. Um, in particular, stem cell therapy comes to mind. Of course, that's a very big field. There are lots and lots of people working on it. It's well funded. Um, however, there are other areas such as, for example, what I like to call molecular regenerative medicine, the removal of accumulated garb molecular garbage inside cells and also in the spaces between cells. Those are areas of regenerative medicine that so far, not very many people understand the value of or even the feasibility of. And so they are areas which we are paying much more attention to and putting as much funding as we can into. And was that not, and was that not the topic of your book, The Free Mitochondrial Theory of Aging? The topic of my book in 2000, or actually in 1999, was in fact a slightly different thing. It was the accumulation of mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. That's another area which is sort of known to be very likely, at least, to be involved in the process of aging in mammals. But people haven't really paid very much attention to it, partly because it it's not clear how the details of the mechanism of how it actually contributes to particular diseases of old age. And secondly, because people have been rather in despair with regard to actually how to fix it. Um, you know, the, the, it's not really clear how we could actually go about reversing the accumulation of mitochondrial mutations. But about 25 years ago, there was a big breakthrough in this area uh, when someone showed, someone in Australia, in fact, showed that it was possible to relocate one of the 13 protein coding genes from the mitochondrial DNA into the nuclear DNA, the normal DNA. They only did this for one gene, and they did it in yeast rather than in humans. And of course, they only did it in cell culture, not in a uh, live mammal. Um, but it was a proof of concept. And what I've been able to do, and which I talked about extensively in the book you refer to, is to revive interest in this area and this possibility. And at the moment, there is quite a lot of interest in this area. There have been one or two very important breakthroughs in the past few years, which mean that the whole idea of relocating all 13 of the mitochondrial protein coding genes to the nucleus, even in people who are already alive, is not nearly so ambitious and you know, science fiction-y as people have historically thought.